Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And it was really an honor to be um, invited. I realize that I'm on a platform. And I, I often tell people, if I fall off, don't worry. I'll be OK. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you laughed at that, because you were supposed to. But I'll be OK. So I'm just going to take you a little bit through my research. But I want you to throw questions at me if you have any. And it's, I want to make it involved. And in, in the part of the research I chose to pick for my little 18 minutes today is is the work I did in college students. Although a lot of my work is in college students, this one was to decrease portion sizes to prevent obesity in college students, i.e. the freshman 15. OK, so hopefully we'll take you through this. And hopefully I can figure out which one this is. Sorry, guys. It's that one, right? A point there to the computer. That, of course, would make sense. And it's the arrow? OK, no, not good. There we go. OK, Let, you know what? Maybe I should stand right here. So this is just a quick overview about obesity in the United States. And I picked Pennsylvania because even though I know all of you are not from Pennsylvania, that this is where we live now. And basically, Pennsylvania patterns the obesity in the United States. So it's not a really good thing. When I came from UMass Amherst to Penn, I, uh, pe people said you'll have a really uh, big population from which to choose because Philadelphia actually is one of the highest ranking cities in obesity as well. And with obesity, I think I skipped a slide. I actually know I did because there's something I want to show you that I think might, might make an impact on you. Those of us in obesity and diabetes research, which is what I do, we know these, we know these slides very well. And if I had time, I would have showed you from 1990s all the way till now. When you look at these graphs, when you, pardon me, when you look at these uh, maps of the United States, you can see across the top it's obesity from 94 to 2008, and down on the bottom is diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, that's the diabetes that you get if you gain weight over time. It used to be known as adult onset, but now because children are getting type 2 diabetes, we actually have to call it type 2 diabetes, and it's typically a result of lack of physical activity and weight gain. And so when you look at these maps, if, again, if I had showed you from way back, they were much lighter because the prevalence of obesity and diabetes was much less throughout the states. But not only did they get darker, they had to keep adding different colors because the um, amount of obesity percentage in each state increased. So you could see on the bottom, it says like greater than 9% and above greater than 26% when you see the darker colors. I'm an alum of Virginia Tech, so that maroon and orange looks pretty good for me. Thank you again, because OK. We, we professors are out of work comedians, so you have to laugh at our stupid jokes. <laughs> you, you must. Otherwise, we don't know what to do. So quickly, this is just very temperamental, so I think I'm just going to hit the Enter key. So quickly, when you look at this, this is showing that from younger age to older age that the rate of type 2 diabetes still increases. It's still greater in people who are older, because oftentimes people gain weight when they're older. I'm going to throw something at you as a young, healthy population, and that is there's no need for that to happen. There's no need for you to think that as you get older, you should do less, because to me, that's, you know, age does not matter. I can tell you that I feel stronger today than I did even a few years ago, and I've added another sport, ice hockey, to my regimen of sports of rowing and field hockey, at the age of 47, I just added that in March. So you should continually do that and challenge yourself, because that also, and you can laugh, but I, you can, it's fine. But you can continually <laughs> challenge yourself to make sure that what you do, both for your mind and for your body, helps yourself. And that's a little off tangent from what I'm going to talk about. But that, I think, is what gets us old. Old is just something that's a number and something in people's heads. But we can, you know, there was a very, very famous rower named Ernestine Bear who was very big for women rowers. She rowed until her 90s before she died. So it doesn't matter how old you are because there are plenty old people who are very young because they're not doing much and they're sitting around. So back to my thing now. I tend to, pe people know that I tend to go off tangent just a tad, but just to kind of get that in your heads about exercise and eating well. Those are the two best medicines we have. Those are the only two medicines that don't have side effects, unless, of course, eat a dozen carrots every day or you, you get injured in, in a sport. But those are the two best medicines that we have. And if we can get people to be more active and to eat better, we could solve a lot of the disease in our country. 
This is just simply telling you that there are a lot of people with diabetes, and unfortunately there are a lot of people with type 2 diabetes who don't know they have it. That's the population that worries me a lot, because if we're not treating their diabetes, then they are going to get greater risk, have greater risks of heart disease and kidney disease that they already have. Um, so thinking about diabetes, thinking about obesity, and then we go back to obesity, and we see that obesity leads to many things. Now, when I tell you about weight loss and when I, whenever I talk to the public about it, it's not because I want everybody to look like size 2 airbrushed models. Those are, they, they are airbrushed. They probably don't get there in the very good way that we want them to. And it's, it's more that we want people to be healthy. And people can be healthy at any weight, but we just need to get people moving and healthy. So this has been a lot of my research over the years. And I'm only going to focus on the environmental change part of this, but I've attacked diabetes and obesity three different ways, by mineral supplementation. I have a trial going on now with magnesium to try to prevent diabetes. And then I've sort of done the typical exercise and diet thing. But then what bothered me was is after people finished my studies, they tended to gain weight again. And it really, really bothered me. So I thought, well, what if I could change the environment to make it a little better for people to be more active and to eat better? So my first thought was, and the reason it's through the lifespan, by the way, is because as you can see, anyone in the United States or actually in the world is prone to obesity. And as much as people will come to me when they come to my lab and they say, you know, Stella, I really think it's my metabolism that's slow. I'll tell you that 95% of the time their metabolism is normal. And, and so as much as they want that to be, it's, it's typically the fact that they've sort of fallen, is it off the wagon? I always forget how that goes, but fallen somewhere on or off the wagon um, where, where they haven't been eating as well and haven't been exercising as well. And, and you all, I know that we have others than, than college students in here, but, but to all of you, but especially to the college students, one line I tell all of my students all the time that they're so sick of is, chronic disease doesn't happen when you're 50. It's starting now. So some of you might have been really active in high school and you come to college and you're like, you're not active anymore. You need to get active because the habits you form now are the habits you'll keep later in life. And, and you'll feel better, you do better. Um, you can, you know, all the time you spend on Facebook maybe, you can just go and exercise, right? <laughs> I mean, so I, I, that's a new line I have to use. I just used that today for the first time. So think about it. There's a lot of time you spend where you're on the computer and you think people think you're working, leave me alone. But you're on Facebook, go and exercise. So, so thank you. You really did laugh at that without me even asking, so I appreciate that. So the best way I thought, let's change the environment. And some research in the past, a very famous guy named Jim Hill, he's out at the University of Colorado in Denver, he said, you know, we can just change calorie intake by 100 calories a day. And if we just minimize one, minus 100 calories a day, which is what? Like uh, even taking, if you have a Snickers bar, maybe having half of it, that if you minus one half a day, we can prevent obesity. And, and again, another tangent. As researchers, now our goal is instead of trying to cause weight loss, we try to measure prevention of obesity because causing weight loss kind of is tough. If we can prevent obesity, then work on weight loss, we're doing our, we're doing our jobs well. But a lot of education stuff hasn't really worked, unfortunately. And so I thought, I'm a university professor. I might as well look at my college campus. And so what I thought was, why don't I write a grant to see if I do one thing. Instead of doing exercise and diet, let me see if I just change portion sizes. Could I prevent weight gain in freshmen? And that was my goal, just to make it a basic, simple design. And so I actually got this grant from NIH at, when I was still at UMass. And, but, um, I transferred it here when I came to Penn, and so the, the research was actually done at Rutgers University, simply because they were very similar as far as a large university, and they had several um, dining commons that were very similar, and that's what I needed, whereas at Penn, the dining commons were slightly different. They weren't all exactly the same. And so what we did was it was a year and a half study, and I always say we because I always have a team of undergraduates and graduate students with me, and, um, and I wouldn't be able to do it without them. But we evaluated whether, whether smaller serving sizes and serving utensils have affected body weight. I've highlighted body weight and body mass index simply because that's all I'll show you today. Do you all know what body mass index is? What is it? Shout it. Wow. I'm impressed. Right? Wait, did I hear weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared? You guys are great. And I know that there's lots of you who are not, you know, nutrition background stuff or nursing or anything. So here's what we did. Students came in. We, we, we had two dining halls, 
and one was the control and one was the intervention. But for six time points, they came to us and we measured their body composition simply by what's called skin folds. Not the best way, but we had to do everything there. And as a matter of fact, you'll laugh at this, some of our measurements were in a back room in the dining hall and I had to get these little block things that, so we could have privacy. But um, the students were great about it and they did have privacy. And we measured their dietary intake, we measured their uh, tray weights when they came in, so, and, we, and we wanted to see, and body weight of course, and then um, evaluated BMI. So, and we measured, Two, we gave them step counters and measured uh, how much they exercised because we were hoping, and we didn't tell them anything, we were hoping that they would not change their activity. So by the way, those of you not into research, especially human research, well, even if it's animal research, we have to get everything approved by what's called the Institutional Review Board. And that's really fully for the protection of human subjects. And as I tell my, my group all the time, the protection of our participants is the most important thing. Obviously, retaining them is important too, but, but re their protection is the most important thing. And the same with people who work with animals. So what we did was we didn't tell them that the study was about. Obviously, the informed consent they signed said we're following them. They sort of thought we were following the health of students. And it wasn't wrong, it wasn't bad. The IRB here at Penn and Rutgers approved that. We weren't trying to be tricky. We just wanted them to be blinded to the study. So one of them, we controlled their portion sizes, and one of them, we kept the same. And basically, if you were to see what we did, we portion sizes were about 20% reduced. But what was interesting was when we met with the dining hall folks, I said, could you cut these to, you know, could, could the staff cut this to this and make this to this? And they looked at me and they said, Stella, you know what? They're used to cutting these pizzas and these sheet cakes, et cetera, for thousands of people every day. And so if we make them change like to an odd number, they're not gonna do it. So they did make them smaller, but we had to also realize, I mean, imagine if you're working in one of those settings, I mean, you're serving a lot of kids every day. So we had to con con sort of bend to them, but they still decreased it, and everything was about by 20%. The food service staff, we kept blinded, because what I was afraid of, was, and I know when I was in college, that they would have said, you know, Stella, you're getting a smaller portion, can I give you more, right? So, so they might have done that to, to the students because they get to know some of the students, and they didn't want them to sort of not get enough. The students were monitored by the swipe cards when they came in. So every time they came in, we knew. Because if half of you were in the control group and this half of you were in the intervention group, we wanted to be sure that you stayed to the control group. And that if you guys were sort of moving into the control cafeterias, we'd have to drop you from the study if you weren't going to this cafeteria for 85% or more of the time. Because otherwise, that's going to confound our results. So we also measured their tray weights just to see how much did they eat. And we didn't tell them they could only go up once. They're still paying for this. We couldn't stop from what they ate there. We couldn't stop them from what they ate outside. And when you take diet records from people, you have to have a real poker face. And, and guys in here, this is not meant to sound sexist, but the guys sometimes they'd say, yeah, I had a hoagie at 2 in the morning. I'm thinking, really? Oh I, but I couldn't show that. I'd have looked down. I'm like, OK. And then when my control subjects would be like, yeah, I'm gaining weight. I need to lose weight. I wanted to say, no, no, no. But you can't say that, right? <laughs> you can't. So as a researcher, you're like, oh, no, no, gain weight. We need you to gain weight. And we need you guys to lose weight. But you can't say that. So you have to look really sort of serious all the time. And, and I'm Italian, and my emotions are right out on my sleeve, so I have to really look down and focus. Like, oh my gosh, Stella, don't show them what you're thinking. And I tell my students that, too. What was great was when, they, when my students took it, the, the diet records, I think that was even better, because students were less intimidated. So I only took diet records when I needed to, but most of the time when they were talking to my students, they were much more honest about you know, anything, alcohol intake, et cetera, which was good, because we wanted them to be honest. We don't want people to hide what they, they ate. So we took 24-hour recalls. As I told you, we measured their physical activity. And this is what our sample size looked like. So we were pretty even with men and women. And this is the ethnicity racial breakup, which very much parallels what Rutgers looks like. Now, when you look at body weight changes, it doesn't look so good, I know. But here's what I'm excited to show you. Um, at least I'm excited. You might be like, oh, gosh, get off the stage. But I'm just excited to show you that we did prevent weight gain when we evaluated body mass index in the intervention group. And even though you may not know this because you are adults, you still have growth during college. And as only being 5'4", I was really glad that I think I got an inch during college because it was really good that I could grow some more. But so that's why body mass index was even a better indicator. Statistically, those of you who know statistics, it wasn't significant, but 
here's some things I want to show you that I want you to hopefully take home with you. That in, in my work, what we say is if there's not a st statistically significant change, there might be a clinically significant change. That means that even though the P is not less than 0.05, it still might impact how the population is and how their health is. And that's what I want to show you. With body weight, the intervention group and the, uh, and the control group had this, these changes in body weight. And if you look at the body mass index, you might think, big deal, 0.8% decrease in BMI? That's nothing. But the control group had a 2% increase, and this is why it's important. Because for about every 1% increase above the desirable BMI, this is any age group. You have about a 3 to a 3.5% three increase in your risk for coronary heart disease. And then again, for every kilogram of weight loss, you have a decrease in coronary heart disease and diabetes risk factors. And then finally, for every kilogram, and this is really pertinent to you, for every kilogram of weight gain that you gain after high school, for women you have about a 6% and for men a 3% increased risk of coronary heart disease. It's not to scare you, it's not, not at all to make you tell you that you should be obsessive and go on the scale every day because there's no way, I don't know the last time I was on a scale. But you just think about, think about again that the line I said before, that chronic disease doesn't start when you're 50. It starts now. So you're, the choices you make now are extremely important to your health later. So basically, we weren't statistically powered to evaluate things like socioeconomic status or gender differences or ethnicity differences or even body mass index differences. Because purposely, purposely we, we actually recruited people who were not overweight or obese. We wanted to see if we could prevent weight gain. For the next grant that I have yet to revise again, because it, wasn't, it was scored but not funded, is that we will then include these things and it will be a larger grant. It will be called what's called an R01 in, in NIH. And so basically, just I, I know I didn't talk about all my aspects of research because I had a limited time with you, but environmental change can really impact how you, you know, take things in, how you might exercise. Some of the other work that I've done since I've been here at Penn is evaluating, for example, how the built environment affects people's physical activity. And we found that, for example, in West Philadelphia, a lot of the broken sidewalks, a lot of the um, uh, no crosswalks prevent people from doing any leisure time physical activity. That is, walking to the store, et cetera. And all that, by the way, counts. The building up of activity during the day does count. So I'm going to end with two things. And they're going to probably make me cry, because I, I don't know why I do this. But my mom passed away about two and a half years ago, but that's her in the garden. And I'm a, I'm a product of two Italian immigrants where, so you can imagine the great food I grew up with and how important eating is in my life, and sitting down to eat. And right here, my mom is showing one of my sisters and one of my nieces, which she would use the scape of the, the, the garlic plant. And some of you are shaking your heads, you know that's the middle part, because my parents grew up not wasting anything, right? So she was showing us how you use that. And the reason I show this not only because I love to honor my mom, but it's also because this is, a, again, another tangential thing, but something I want you to take home with, is that unfortunately, I think especially in our country, we've moved away from a good relationship with food. People, gosh, when I go out to dinner with people, they're like, oh, Stella, I don't know what to get. I'm like, get whatever the heck you want, because <laughs> I'm going to get what I want, and I'm going to enjoy it. But we've sort of stopped this enjoyment of food, and people will say, I feel guilty after eating that, or you know, we need to work on that relationship and keeping it good. And I think that's one of the big reasons that we have an obesity epidemic. There's many reasons, but that's one of them. Because people would rather choose foods that might be made of processed stuff that might be less calories and eat many more of them than actually eating one piece of a cookie that's, that's full fat. And then finally, this is the other thing. It's because those are my two dogs, but one of them just passed away. But, but to also honor Penn Vet School, because I love them dearly. And the, my guy on the left is Osco. He's almost 15, but he's just been diagnosed with lymphoma, but he's doing well. And she, Chenna's on the right. But um, as far as when we go to the activity part, and again, this is just again for you to keep in your head, is dogs and kids, they're always active. They always move around. They do spontaneous activity. And somehow when we get older, we lose that. So think in yourself, to yourself, eat healthy most of the time, but enjoy what I eat. And try to be spontaneously active, or when you go to the gym, look at it differently and have fun when you're doing it. And I think, again, people look at activity as, when I tell them I could be a professional athlete, they look at me like, oh, if I could. 
they, they, they'd be like, Stella, really? I hate to exercise. And I think exercise should be fun too, but it's kind of how people view it that makes it not so much fun. I hope that I didn't go too fast because you guys were just a great audience and I was so honored to come here. But I really, really thank you for your attention. I thank Kathy, Catherine, and Yee and Adam for inviting me and thank you again. Thanks so much. That was a great talk to have right after lunch. Um, so the next uh, speaker we're going to have, just like the first session, is not going to be a speaker. Uh, we're going to play another one of our favorite videos. And this one is by Jonathan Klein, and it's called Photos That Change the World. <laughs> Our next speaker is Neil Blumenthal, and he loves helping people see. Determined to radically transform the eyewear industry, Neil and three friends launched Warby Parker, an eyewear company which sells sunglasses for a quarter of the price of its competitors and donates a pair for every pair sold. From there, Neil, began, Neil became a director of Vision Spring. His passion for eyewear led him to expand Vision Spring to 10 countries in the developing world. Here to share his story and how something as small as eyewear can make a difference, uh, please welcome Neil Blumenthal.